texts in the New Testament that help us see um, or to add meat to uh, that little theme that we took upon ourselves at the beginning of the year from Philippians 1.27, <clears throat> striving together for the faith of the gospel. Two weeks ago, we looked at Revelation 7.9, which shows us a numberless multitude of people from every corner of the globe in unity singing praises to Christ. Um, that is what takes place in glory. It is what will take place in glory. And we should be a small picture of that now in our life together as a church and as individual Christians, that we strive together now. And one day we shall do it perfectly. But we are to be a picture of it even now when we're marred by sin and difficulty and so on. Last week, we looked at Hebrews chapter 12, um, talking about the race, the, the Christian life being a race. We are in this race to persevere. We are to look to Jesus. We are to consider Jesus. And we are to keep our eyes out for other believers in the race whose arms might grow tired, whose knees may grow wobbly, and we are, unlike real races where you're not allowed to help other runners, we are in a race where helping other runners is an absolute necessity. There are days when my knees are weak and I need someone to help me. There are days when your hands will fall by your side and you're not running as well and you need somebody to help you. That is an important way in which we are to strive together for the faith of the gospel. This morning, we are going to do what we do every month on the first Sunday of the month, and that is observe the Lord's table. Jesus said, do this. Over 2,000 years ago, and for 2,000 years, the church has been celebrating the Lord's Supper. <clears throat> there have been wars fought over this. There have been many battles about what it means how it's to be properly done, whether you should kneel or stand, whether the priest should put it in your mouth or you should take it, whether you should drink the wine or not. All kinds of battles have been fought over this, exactly what Jesus intended uh, when he instituted the Lord's Supper. And the Lord's Supper is very much related to this theme of striving together for the faith of the gospel. This is communion. It is us being in communion with our God, and it is us being in communion with each other. We call this an ordinance in the tradition of which we are a part because Jesus ordained it to be done. We can't say everything that can be said about the table in one message but we're going to just focus on one thing as it relates to this striving together. But the first thing to mention is this. This service matters. The observance of the Lord's Supper is not something tacked on to the end of a service that just makes the service even longer than it would have been if we hadn't done it. It is a matter of great importance. I think that Acts 2.42 is just about a summary of everything the church is meant to be. <clears throat> Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people are converted and baptized. And those who were baptized, we are told in Acts 2.42, devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine, to the breaking of bread, to the fellowship, and to prayer. The Apostles' doctrine is the word of God. The fellowship is us. Prayer is prayer. The breaking of bread is not just a meal. The early church was not devoted to eating. Unless it was a Baptist church. You know, we're devoted to eating. But they were not. The, it, the, Acts 2.42 is not saying that the early church was devoted to eating. 
And it's not just saying they were devoted to getting together and fellowshipping. That's included in devoted to the fellowship. What this text means when it says devoted to the breaking of bread, they were devoted to this. The observance and celebration of the Lord's Supper. The word devoted means to give oneself to, to persevere in, to attend to with rigor. We do it rigorously. We will not let this go by without doing it. The early church preserved, per, persevered in observing the Lord's Supper. They were committed to it. They refused to let it become ordinary or routine or mere ritual. It mattered to them. It was not a matter of frivolity. It was important. It should be so for us. We do not treat this as just an amendment to the service. The Lord's Supper is part of what God has given us so that we can strive together for the faith of the gospel. He has, in the words of 2 Peter 1, 3, God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. What has he given us? Well, he's given us a bunch of stuff, and this is one of them. The, the observance in the church by believers of the Lord's Supper is part of what God has given us so that we can live a life of godliness before him. The Lord uses the Lord's Supper to help us remain faithful to him in the midst of all the things that grab at us in the run of a week to make us unfaithful to him. This matters. In verse 20 of this text, Paul says this to the Corinthians. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. When the Lord's Supper is not the Lord's Supper. This is the longest text in the Bible about the Lord's Supper. And Paul has this lengthy portion in the, in the letter that he wrote to Corinthians to correct their wrong observance of the Lord's Supper. And what he says that they're doing wrong, we can glean from that of the right way to do it. He says, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Somebody says, yes, it is. We set it up. We have the wine. We have the bread. We say the prayers. We pass it out. We eat. We drink. That's the Lord's Supper. But if you read your Bible with your eyes open, you will know that one of, one of the most prevalent sins that God addresses throughout all of the Old and New Testament is when ritual passes for belief. When people do the right forms, but their heart is not in it. This was a major message of the prophets to the Old Testament Israelites. I, he says through, Amos says to the people, I hate your festivals. I hate your gatherings. Well, God ordained the festivals. God ordained the gatherings. How can he say he hates them? Because of something like what Jesus, when he quoted the Old Testament, when he said about the Pharisees, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You go through, you do A, B, C, D, but your heart is not there. And the greatest commandment, which did, was it's, it's not invented in the New Testament, it's in the book of Leviticus, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. And the way we bring the sacrifices in the Old Testament system, the way we celebrate the festivals, the way that we observe these rituals is from the heart. We believe them. Jesus in Matthew 23, just shortly before he's arrested, in this, this sermon speech that he gave to the Pharisees in Matthew 23, might be just what put them over the edge. He just slams into them for this false kind of belief. 
You tithe. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Hypocrites, he says. You tithe mint and dill and cumin, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law. Justice, mercy, faithfulness. Those are heart issues. I can give my 10% and have my heart a thousand miles away. I can give my 10%. Here's my 10%. You know, and that does not please God. And that's what Jesus is attacking. That's what God attacked through, read the minor prophets, and you see it coming up again and again and again. The woman at the Samaritan, the, the Samaritan woman at the well, she says, you Jews think we should meet here. And Jesus says, it's not a matter of where. It's a matter of how. God is spirit. You must worship him in spirit and truth. And we too can fall into thinking that if we just do the right things, if we sit quietly and listen intently and have our decorum right, that we have celebrated the Lord's Supper. And I don't know what the decorum... Well, some people are getting drunk, so the decorum may not be that great at the Corinthian celebration. But the Corinthians thought that all that was necessary for the proper observance of the Lord's Supper was to eat and drink. And they've got this banquet attached to it where they bring a lot of food and they eat and they drink. And at the end of this, they have this observance of the Lord's Supper. And what Paul is saying to them is that that banquet ahead of time means you're not celebrating the Lord's Supper at all. And he tells them why. Verse 18. In the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. Here is the reason why when the Corinthian church was gathering together to celebrate communion, they were not celebrating communion at all. They are not striving together in any sense. Division is a major problem in the Corinthian church. It's one of the major reasons that Paul wrote the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians in, in the first place. There is a lack of unity in this church that is off the scale. Chapter 1, verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, infants in Christ. You're babies, he says. How did he, what made Paul think these people were babies in the faith? For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the faith? Are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? I know you're babies, he says, because you don't get along. Oh, my word. I know famous preachers. I don't know them personally. You know, they can exegete the Greek upside down and backwards. They know this stuff. They don't get along with anybody. And Paul would come to them and say, what a baby you are. And they would respond, oh yeah, watch this. Greek exegesis. No. You're a baby. Because you don't get along. You can't get along with anybody. How many Baptists does it take to have a fight? One. You know, I disagree with myself sometimes. Chapter 12, verse 12. In one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. All were made to drink of one spirit. Chapter 13, the great love chapter. Love is kind. Love is patient. Love doesn't envy. Doesn't boast. It isn't arrogant. It isn't rude. It does not insist on its own way. All of these things relate to how we get along with other people. Chapter 14, verse 12. So you yourselves, so with yourselves, since you are eager for the manifestation of the Spirit, you are eager to show off your gifts. And then he says this, strive to excel in building up the church. Chapter 16, verse 14. Let all that you do, you do be done in love. And he tackles this matter of division in them in their observance of the Lord's Supper. Verse 21. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. This is stunning. We're going to have the Lord's Supper next week, they say. And we're going to have the banquet beforehand. It's a potluck. Bring some food along. 
bring something to drink. Here comes a guy, a whole case of wine on his shoulder, and he's got, you know, roast pork under his arm, and he plunks it down on the table. Somebody comes in with half a loaf of bread and a bottle of water. Well, that's uncomfortable. Some have suggested they didn't even eat in the same room. You go to the other room, because it's really disturbing to have to watch you eat almost nothing while I got all this food. Never occurred to them. Share it. And the reason it didn't occur to them, they don't like these people. They're poor. They don't smell right. They do things funny. Whatever it is. So you go over there and, and eat. We had, <laughs> we had some guests at our retreat center one time. And we have missionary pictures in the walls, uh, uh, on the walls in the rooms where people sleep. And this young lady came to me and she said, could we take down the picture, the pictures in the wall of, of your mission field? I said, why? She said, well, they, look, they, they don't look that comfortable. And it makes me uncomfortable to think that I'm comfortable when they're not. I said, no, we're going to leave it up there because that's accomplishing the very purpose for which I put it there. <laughs> I want you to know that not everybody is. And that's what's happening here. There's poor people in, this, in, in the Corinthian church. I, by the way, the point of this message is not for me to say that that's how we're doing this. What Paul is talking about is he's, he's talking about disunity. And the way they showed it up in their church was rich versus poor. But the, the, the undergirding principle is, if we're going to gather around the table, we have to be together. We have to be united as believers. Now, I preached this at 9 o'clock, and somebody came to me after the service and said, does this mean that if we're going to be really united, it doesn't matter how a person lives? Well, no, it doesn't mean that. If somebody says they're a Christian and they are a serial adulterer and he's sleeping around with whatever will have him six nights a week and he says, uh, we got to be united around the table, we say, no, that's not Christian behavior and you got to get that fixed. So please understand the context in which I'm saying this. We're not saying that sin doesn't matter, but we are saying that in Christ at the table, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. It's flat. And there are things about other people that I don't like. I'm just, I am the grumpiest man on the planet sometimes, I think. And, you know, I'm just, you, why did you do that? Why did you do this? Why are you so stupid? But at the table, God welcomes people that I don't get along with. God welcomes stupid people. And you can look at me and say, Ken, that's you. That's fine. As long as you don't say, since you're so stupid, you can't eat. Because what Paul is saying here is, whatever the difference is, this covers it. This doesn't this makes everything not matter not the unrepented sin keep saying that so you understand the context we come in here whatever it is that separates people in the world your favorite this your taste on this your view of the second coming this church takes a stand that the pastorate is only for men and in a group this size, there might be some people disagree with that. You can join us here. If you are following Jesus Christ, and you love him, and you are trusting him to save you from your sins, I will sit at this table with a Presbyterian till the day I die, if he loves Jesus, even though I think he's got it all wrong about baptism. Because he is trusting Christ. The ground at the foot of the cross is the level. Verse 22. So that's that point. Uh, what was it? That's when the Lord's table is not the Lord's table. 
when we let divisions interfere with the proper observance of it, we will not. Whatever, whatever they are within the bounds of Christian morality, there are different beliefs. There are different likes and dislikes. But if we are trusting Christ and we are seeking to live a life of obedience to him, folks, we do this together. Then in verse 22, he says, What? I love that. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? They were so divided in this church that their celebration of the Lord's Supper, Paul called it a hatred of the church, to come before the cross and say, I get to eat this, you do not, even though he is trusting Christ like I am. But he's poor, or he's rich, or he's stupid, or his view of the second coming is all out of whack. Paul says, that's, a dis that's to despise the church of God. Romans 15, 12. Let, a, let each of us please his neighbor to build him up. 1 Corinthians 14, 12. With your, so with yourselves, since you are eager to express the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. 1 Corinthians 14, 26. Let all things be done for building up. 2 Corinthians 13, 10. The authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. Ephesians 4, 15, 16. We make sure that the body grows so that it builds itself up in love. Ephesians 4, 29. Only such as is good for building up. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. You'd almost think Paul thought this was important. Paul says to the Corinthians, instead of humiliating these poor believers in the church, you should have been going out of your way to build them up. At the table. At the table. These differences that occur amongst real Christians, these disagreements, that would cause us in the world to separate and cause division, are gone. They don't exist. Don't despise the church, he says to them. And then he says, after telling them not, after telling them that they are despising the church, what's the next thing he gets into? And it's, it's a striking thing. He says to them in verse 22, Do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Why not, Paul? He says to them there, What shall I say to you? You're doing this. What shall I say? And what does he say? For I received from the Lord what I delivered to you. He said, you, You're making a mockery of the Lord's Supper. And I know how to bring unity. You know what brings unity in this church? He says to them, I'm going to remind you that this service is about Jesus' broken body and shed blood. What is going to cure the Corinthian church is a focus on the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. What did we see last week in Hebrews 12? Looking unto Jesus, let us run the race. Consider him. I got my focus on Christ, and I see the guy with the wobbly knees. Because I'm Christ-centered, I want to help that guy. And Paul sees the Corinthians just making a mockery of the Lord's Supper, and he says to them, do you know what the solution is? Remember Christ. I received what I, from the Lord what I passed on to you. Jesus said, this is my body. When we, 
we, we know this isn't the physical body of Christ. But we are portraying a reality here when we eat Christ in us, the hope of glory. His blood cleanses us from all our sins inside and out. That's the solution to whatever divides us as believers is this. Jesus came, gave up his body, shed his blood. He is the great unifier. He is the one who enables us to be together through his blood. The table points to Jesus Christ crucified and risen and coming again. And at the table, we look to him. We all eat and we are all made new by him. And we we sit here at his feet together, remembering him and proclaiming him. And dear ones, that erases everything. And that is what enables us to strive together for the faith of the gospel. These verses were Paul that I will read when we have the Lord's table in a few minutes. These verses tell us that the thing we need in order to bring an end to whatever division is in us is the thing that we already have. We have the broken body. We have the shed blood. Why should I get along with you? Why should you get along with me? I am so whatever you don't like. Because on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he broke bread and said, this is my body. He took the cup and said, this is the blood. This is the new covenant in my blood. And that's why you have to even struggle to get along with me because Jesus is bigger and Jesus is better. And this matters a lot. This is where we keep the short. This is where we, where we keep our records short with Christ. Now, you know that I always got the Sunday school teachers in my head, but just this one thing, he goes into verse 27. That famous verse, don't eat. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner. What has Paul been talking about with these people? Their disunity. How do they take the cup in an unworthy manner? By not paying attention, by not being united. This isn't saying you have to be worthy to come to the table. If we have to be worthy to come to the table, then we can never have the Lord's Supper again. None of us are worthy. But what he's saying here is, your problem is your disunity. Whatever our problem is, take it to God, take it to Christ. And don't have unrepentant sin on your record. That's, that's the unworthy taking. And for these people, it was their disunity. Get along, he says, and you can take this. You will be taking this in the proper manner, since Christ has done this. <laughs> the elders and I, or the elders, us, were discussing a hymn the other day. It's got four verses, but I only have the first one memorized. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. And it is portrayed here. This is communion. Our communion with God because of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Because he broke his body and shed his blood. Because he did that, I have communion with God. And because he did that, I have communion with all of you. And all of you have communion with each other. And you even have to let me in that circle and commune with me too. This is a marvel in our eyes. This is what the cross is about. This is what this table is about. Let us take and eat together, rejoicing. 
the cross, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you have done for us. We thank you for what Paul said to the Corinthians. We thank you for leaving it for us all these 2,000 years so we could benefit from it now. And we pray that we would be a testimony of what this table is about. Communion with God and communion with each other. And as we eat and drink, strengthen us, empower us even more to strive together for the faith of the gospel. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.